When the Netherlands held an election recently, nobody expected that the results would cause a political earthquake. A lot of people, if you would have asked them a year ago, would have called you uh, mad, and uh, it happened today, so I'm very proud. The far-right populist Gert Wilders and his Freedom Party won more seats than any other party in the Dutch elections. The biggest threats to our survival today and the threats to our freedom are the European Union, mass immigration and this terrible Islamic ideology of submission and violence. The anti-Islam, anti-immigration, anti-EU politician is now desperately trying to form a government. His victory and his divisive brand of politics is still causing tremors in the Netherlands and across Europe. I'm really flabbergasted and shocked and angry and I feel sad about the election results. I personally think we need a change in the Netherlands. Let this man prove what he really has to offer. Really everything that's dear to us and that we find important is at stake here. The victory of Gert Wilders was a shock, but he isn't an anomaly. Instead, he's just the latest domino in a wave of far-right populism across Europe. Gert Wilders is a bit like the French Le Pen, yeah, or this is the Trump moment of Dutch politics. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, Gert Wilders, the rise of the Dutch Trump. My name is Bruno Waterfield. I am the Brussels correspondent for The Times. I'm one of the longest serving newspaper correspondents here in Brussels, which is the heart of the European Union. The institutions are mainly based here, so I've been writing a lot about European politics and Brexit over now almost 20 years. So yes, I know this town very, very well. And in fact, today I'm up in NATO for a meeting of foreign ministers. That is an epic stint. And Bruno, whilst you've been watching the EU from your perch in Brussels, the last week or so was an odd moment because much of the continent was quite shocked by the results of the elections in the Netherlands. What did you make of them? And just explain why, why they were so surprising. I think the real surprise was that Gert Wilders, a leader of the Freedom Party, of his Freedom Party, the PVV, as it's known in the Netherlands, actually won. He got the plurality or the largest share of a vote. Now, the EU is used to populists and populists who are extreme nationalists like Wilders, but they're not used to them being the largest party. They're not used to them winning. So it's not that it's totally unexpected, but it was a surprise that Gert Wilders in a country like the Netherlands, in Holland, which is renowned for being liberal, for being stable, for being an orderly country, that most voters voted. The biggest share of the vote was for Gert Wilders, a man who previously has been in the political wilderness because of his views and indeed court convictions for hate speech. Yeah. I mean, as you say, sort of a massive shock. Firstly, that it happened that he got the most votes, but also that it's the Netherlands, which has a reputation for being more liberal and more moderate. Just give us a sense of what were, what were you hearing in Brussels? What was the reaction like there? Well, the reaction here is people are worried because, look, if a stolid Dutch, the sensible Dutch, can vote for somebody like Wilders, well, you know, the French, the possibility of Marine Le Pen winning in France seems mm. much, much stronger. So that's the kind of shock element. But it's also really important for British listeners to realise that the Netherlands, that Holland, isn't just Amsterdam. Because quite often when we think about the Netherlands, we think of Amsterdam, we think of cannabis coffee shops and those brothel windows um, in the Wallen district 
of the city. In fact, Holland is a very divided country. You've got urban centres like Amsterdam, Rotterdam, The Hague that are like some of the urban centres in the southeast of Britain. They're fashionable, metropolitan. They've got quite progressive ideas, green ideas, very popular there. And then you've got people out of the big cities who are still very religious as a Bible Belt in the Netherlands. And Farmers particularly who are suffering and farms are being closed to meet climate change targets. So there are two Hollands, if you like, and this election really, really showed that one part of Holland, the more traditionalist Holland that wants to stop an influx of asylum seekers, that wants to row back on climate change measures, is in the ascendant. That's so interesting. And to give people who haven't followed politics in the Netherlands very closely, to give them an idea of just how... Unexpected it is for a character like Wilders in particular to win. Just stepping back, tell us a bit about him. Remind us of his history, who he is, and a bit about his rise. Well, I mean, Gert Wilders is surprisingly well known. He's, he's quite striking. He's got this sort of bouffant, swept back, peroxide blonde hairdo. So in that sense, you know, Donald Trump springs to mind or the new chap now in uh, Argentina. <laughs> He's often been, as I said, out in the wilderness. He's often been quite isolated. His nearest ally uh, has been Marine Le Pen in France. She's also got a peroxide blonde hairdo as well. So he's been really sort of out on the margins. And actually, unlike Le Pen in France, he has not compromised until these elections. He has not compromised on really incendiary language attacking Islam and Muslims. His political manifesto actually has a banning of most Muslim religious practices, the closing of mosques, the banning of the Quran, and the banning of all Islamic schools. Proposals that, in fact, are in complete breach of uh, the Dutch constitution, which has enshrined religious freedom, if you think of uh, wars of the Reformation going right back to the 16th century. He became very well known in Britain in 2009. He was arrested at, at Heathrow um, Airport. I actually followed him on the plane. He was arrested by police officers yeah, after defying an entry ban by... Jackie Smith, the then Labour Home Secretary at the time, and he'd been invited by the House of Lords because he made this absolutely, again, incendiary of a word, inflammatory film about Islam called um, Fitness. So he became well known in Britain. Latterly, he's become you know, a friend of Tommy Robinson, which probably shows where he is on the scale of British politics. Um, somehow he's been in court, as I said, in terms of hate speech prosecutions because of some of his comments about Moroccans. If you look at him, he's also very clearly of mixed race heritage. His mother was born in Indonesia. And Wilders is very sensitive about his personal and family life. He was born in 1963 in Venlo, close to the German border. He grew up in a quite strict Roman Catholic family. He's got a brother and two sisters who have expressed concern many times about his politics, not just his strong, divisive views, but also because of fears over his safety, because he lives a very isolated life under police protection and regularly has to move, safe houses movements are kept very, very secret. So he's he's a strange character in many ways. Bruno, he certainly sounds fascinating. There's so much there. I I totally forgot to tell you about his cats. (laughs) <laughs> so his cats. Tell us, tell us about the cats. Yeah, I mean, this guy, you know, he's married to his wife, Christina. They don't have any children. They have two cats, and they have a cat called Snoitji and Plushji, and they even have a special Twitter account, and they post photographs For the cats. from time to time. Yeah, they post photographs of these cats. So that gives you another side of, of Gert Wilders. He's got this crazy hair, inflammatory language. He has to live under police protection because of the kind of things that he says, and he loves his cats. Bruno, there's just so much there I want to know more about. Firstly, well done on identifying what I think has been an overlooked trait in the past, but there's clearly something about right-wing populism, strong men in politics and dodgy hair. Somebody somewhere will be writing a dissertation on that before we know it. But it's particularly interesting that he he comes from sort of a mixed-race heritage. Does it feed into his beliefs? I mean, how did he sort of first become known for, for his sort of very strong anti-Islamic rhetoric. And is there sort of, is there an irony about being sort of so anti one portion of society when you come from a mixed race background yourself? Well, I think he'd argue that, you know, he's not a racist. He doesn't believe that people of his heritage, Indonesians, are inferior. Uh, That's not his argument at all. What he argues is it's not about Arabs 
for example, it's about Islam, which he says is argues is a retarded culture, even though he then went once went on to say that it should be fewer Moroccans in the Netherlands. So he, he focuses on the religion and the cultural aspect rather than race. And that would be his argument. And of course, many Dutch people do have this heritage because of the long relationship, colonial relationship as well, between the Netherlands and uh, Indonesia. That's fascinating. And, you know, as you say, he's sort of, he's made his name by saying the things that would normally get you banned about the religion of Islam in particular. You mentioned that he was banned from this country briefly. Just remind us how that came about. And then you were on the plane with him. Just talk us through that day. What was that visit like? Well, he likes, he likes attention. And why not? I mean, I think all politicians like attention. I don't think uh, he's unusual in that. So yes, the aeroplane was full of TV cameras and, and all sorts. And he made it, did lots of press releases on um, how he was defying the um, entry ban. So a lot of a lot of media there. So he was relaxed. And the Islam question isn't something he invented. You've got to think back to 2004 when he founded his party, was in the wake of the assassination of Theo van Gogh, a radical anti-Islam filmmaker an artist who was killed by an Islamist, Moroccan origin extremist. What happened here last week, on, uh, exactly a week ago, is of course terrible for the whole Dutch society. This, when this happened again, I think uh, Holland will never be the same again. That came two years after the assassination of, some people might remember him, Pim Fortune in 2002. The right-wing political leader Pim Fortune, known for his anti-immigration and anti-Muslim views, was assassinated. Mr. Fortune's party was expected to do very well next week in parliamentary elections. He was killed by a left-winger who was worried that he was scapegoating Muslims. So the issue of Islam, the issue of Islamic violence was huge, absolutely huge in the Netherlands of its time. 20 uh, years ago, and at that moment, in 2004, the same year Theo van Gogh was killed, Wilder's name was found on this, an Islamist terrorist cell's death list, and that's why he lives under police protection. And of course, there are politicians in Pakistan and elsewhere who have called on people to kill him. Wow. I mean, that will make it very hard to be the prime minister of a country. You mentioned the sort of backdrop of sort of anti-Islamic feeling, fear of radical Islam in the Netherlands as Wilders was making his name. Just talk us through how he began and t tell us a bit about the party that he founded. So, yes, he began with the debates that were raging about Islam in the Netherlands. 20 years ago, there were debates about whether the burqa should be banned. Particularly, there were debates about whether Muslims living in the Netherlands should have stricter requirements in terms of educating their children to make sure they were more integrated. And he used his platform as an M existing MP in the Conservative Party, the VVD. He used that as a platform, a very rebellious platform, to make these very inflammatory statements about Islam. After the killing of Van Gogh, he created his own party with its central platform as banning the Koran, shutting down mosques. So he's, he, in so many respects, he had one unique selling point, and that was being anti-Islam. And I think that probably isn't the secret of his success. I think the secret of his success and the reason why he got um, votes is because he's an outsider. The Dutch political establishment, which is often referred to by people as the cartel, which forms coalitions year in and year out, is very unpopular. It's not seen as representing uh, Dutch people. There have been all kinds of scandals over welfare and stigmatising uh, welfare claimants. There's a cost of living crisis in the Netherlands, the out-of-touch, as it's often described, political elite is, is implementing very uh, controversial and unpopular net zero measures, a bit like in the UK. So Wilders got a lot of those votes, partly because he was an outsider and people see him as an alternative to the political establishment. And that's why the real secret of his success in these elections was he dropped all talk about Islam. He didn't call for mosques to be banned. He didn't call for the Koran to be banned. And that, in a country where there are still many Christians who don't aren't very keen on, on religious sectarianism for understandable reasons, seems to have been the secret of his success. People voted for him quite often tactically because they want a mould-breaking 
right wing coalition particularly to tackle the migration issue in the Netherlands. So Bruno, you described how Wilders has done incredibly well in this election by being the outsider, by being the candidate people who were fed up with the government could vote for, but also not by mentioning all of his sort of anti-Islamist views in the way that he has in the past. Just give it a sense of the policy platform he did get elected on. What, what were the things that he was touting? So what he has really touted during the elections, and they are the themes actually of, of, of all the main parties as well, but he's taken a much stronger position, is reducing the number of asylum seekers, particularly this is in the context of a, a much wider European migration crisis, which is approaching of the levels we saw back in 2015, 2016, building more cheap housing. Again, a bit of a resonance there in, in UK terms. Holland is a very crowded country. Housing is extremely expensive, particularly where people actually want to live. And that was a big electoral issue. And dealing with the cost of living, the impact of inflation and higher energy bills in the Netherlands has had a big impact on people's wallets and they're angry. So... I suppose we should say, if we're trying to understand his victory, it's not so much that the Netherlands has suddenly turned very radically anti-Islam. There were other issues that they were voting on. Primarily, voters wanted a break um, with the past. They wanted a break with the past parties who have run Dutch politics through coalitions. And, and there was a lot of very interesting polling about halfway through the election campaign, so about a month ago, showing large numbers of Dutch voters, even people who weren't going to vote for him, even people who voted for the socialists, who wanted him to be in a coalition to ensure that a right-wing coalition or any government coalition would, would stick to those policies. And Wilders sort of surfed that, so he dropped a lot of his controversial language, even on the European Union, hoping this would make him more appealing as a coalition figure to voters. And in fact, he was, he was nicknamed, he was dubbed Milders, from Wilders to Milders. And that's a pun that works equally well in Dutch and, and English. This is the milder version of him. It's yes, for Milders, Wilders. Yeah, it works in both languages. <laughs> you say it differently, but it's the same. And what happens next? Because he won the bulk of the, the votes, but he doesn't automatically get to form a government. No, he won 37 seats out of a parliament of 150. So he got about 25% um, of the vote. And that tells you how fragmented Dutch politics has been. There are 16 political parties represented um, in the Dutch parliament of 150 seats. So forming a coalition that can get 76 votes or more a majority is very, very difficult. And if you're Gert Wilders, it's even more difficult because mm. there are parties who don't really want to work with you because of your previous unconstitutional policies. And they really don't really want to serve under you when you're a prime minister leading a coalition. And that's his problem. So the, the Conservative VVD, which came in third place, that would be his ideal coalition partner. There's a new Conservative, new social contract party, which is sort of fracturing of the Christian Democrats here that wants to re-establish trust with politicians. That's got about 20 seats. And then there are other small populist parties. So he could patch a coalition together. But the VVD particularly, which is led by very charismatic, very popular, everyone thought she'd be the first female prime minister of the Netherlands, Yizan Yeshelgutz, she really does not want to serve under Gert Wilders. So what might happen, what we might see is months of haggling Wilders has chosen a former Labour education minister to be his uh, negotiator, which is interesting. This guy, Plastark. Unexpected. Well, it's it, it's interesting. This guy, uh, Ronald Plastark, writes a column and he actually said that it is time to have a change. And rather than ignoring Gert Wilders or trying to work around it, the uh, Dutch political establishment should be forced to go into government with him. Essentially, what might happen is that Gert Wilders is himself unable to form a coalition with him as Prime Minister, which might leave the emergence of a coalition just with him in government. That is quite possible. And Bruno, you say that the VVD, the right-wing party who Wilders would most like to be in coalition with, are very reluctant to get into bed with him. If he does end up forming a, a government, do we think Muslims in the country, for example, will they feel safer because the, the people he goes into coalition with would want particular policies to protect them? Or, or do you think it, you know, he, he will get the full Wilders treatment? 
he's made it very clear that as far as he's concerned, he's completely dropping his uh, anti-Islam policies from government. But of course, it is frightening for many Muslim and Moroccans because of his past hostility, because of the kinds of things that he has said. Perhaps the only consolation is that he won votes by toning it down a bit. There have been a lot of comparisons made between Wilders and Donald Trump. You've certainly compared the bouffant hair. Are there similarities? I mean, if he does end up forming a government, would Trump be the sort of role model that would be based on? Well, I think that America and Europe is so different. I mean, certainly Donald Trump is, is someone who Wilders admires and admired when he was president of the United States. I believe that Donald Trump, whatever you might think of him, is the first real um, 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 leader in the United States who dares to talk about the issue of immigration, about Islam, about national sovereignty. But Wilders will have nothing like that kind of power, even if he becomes prime minister of the Netherlands. He'll be prime minister of a coalition government. He will be prime minister of a country that is very middle of the road, that is pretty unradical. So I don't think... He, in that sense, he is Donald Trump. But yes, I mean, he's in the Netherlands, he's, he's often known, or certainly in the international press, he's often known as the uh, Dutch Donald Trump. And Bruno, you, you mentioned that, you know, it was a real shock when the election results came through, that it had happened in, in the Netherlands in particular, and he'd won outright. But this is becoming a bit of a trend across the EU. We did have Georgia Maloney in Italy. We've seen far-right governments on the rise in, in Finland, where, where they've unseated the Prime Minister, Sanna Marin. And there's also a right-wing populist movement in, in Sweden that sort of has gained huge ground too. I mean, what's going on? Is this from your, your perch in Brussels? Is this something you're seeing spreading across the EU? Well, I think there is something in the air. You could argue there's been something in the air for, for quite some time now. One of the most sort of predictable and risable things that people say here in Brussels is, oh, the populist wave is receding, but it, it certainly doesn't seem to. The problem is, is that since the Eurozone crisis, the economy doesn't feel fixed for many Europeans, and that's only been made a lot, lot worse by the energy crisis caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, migration was supposed to be fixed after the crisis in 2015, 2000. Uh, a 16. It hasn't been. The levels of irregular or illegal migrants coming into Europe have hit the same levels as 2016. You've got to remember as well, because we often forget it in Britain, that most of the attackers who carried out the Bataclan and Paris attacks in November 2015 and then the Brussels bombing, something very close to me, in March 2016 actually travelled into Europe um, using the Western Balkans mm. migration routes. So there's always been a associ very strong association uh, with security and terrorism to the migration issue. So you've got a real sense that the mainstream parties who have been running things now more or less for a generation haven't really fixed things. And they've often been, to say the least, a little bit snooty about decisions made by voters. I think if you look at some of the trends that gave rise to Brexit in Britain in 2016, you can see a lot of that discontent, that disenchantment, and anger in many, many countries across the European Union, particularly, actually, in the Netherlands and in France. Is there also a correlation with the economy? Because we've sort of seen most economies across the EU stagnating over the last year or two. And we did see this sort of in 2008, after the financial crisis, suddenly the rise of right-wing parties in countries across Europe where they hadn't had much of a presence before. I think that's a factor, and I think it's a factor particularly in terms of cost of living and poll after poll in every European country shows that there is a new generation of uh, people with children who think that their, their offspring, their families will have a worse life than they have had. But I think it's actually more profound than that, much, much more profound. I think many, many people across Europe, in various countries, no longer feel that their political class represents them. They no longer feel that the political order really represents their values, represents their communities. And again, you know, you come back to the big discussions which are taking part in every European country over sort of woke ideas, 
The idea, very common in Europe, that nationalism and the nation state is very, very negative. And that's really out of step with how a lot of people are feeling at the moment. They actually want some more traditional values, perhaps, in terms of families uh, and communities. And they also want a strong nation state to look after them in a much more turbulent and much more worrying world. You've been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to the subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Manveen Rana, and my guest, Bruno Waterfield, who writes for The Times in Brussels. You can find all of his dispatches on what is a fascinating time for European politics at thetimes.co.uk with a subscription. The producer today was Priyanka Deladia, The executive producer was Fiona Leach and sound design was by Hannah Farrell. If you enjoyed this podcast, please do leave us a review. It'll help others to find it. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow.